came back. If, any... <laughs> if anybody should be able to understand evolution, it is me. Because I make molecules for a living. And I don't just buy a kit and mix this and mix this and get that. I mean, ab initio, I make molecules. I understand how hard it is to make molecules. I understand that if I take nature's toolkit, it can be much easier because all the tools are already there and I just mix it in the proportions that, and I do it, do it under these conditions. And it, but ab initio is very, very hard. I don't understand evolution. And I will confess that to you. Is it okay for me to say that I don't understand this? Is that all right? I know that there's a lot of people out there that don't understand anything about ev organic synthesis, but they understand evolution. I understand a lot about making molecules. I don't understand evolution. And you would say that, wow, I must be really unusual. Let me tell you what goes on in the back rooms of science. With National Academy members, with Nobel Prize winners, I have sat with them. And when I get them alone, not in public, because it's, it's a scary thing if you, t if you say what I just said. And I say, do you understand all of this, where all of this came from and how this happens? Every time that I have sat with people they, who are synthetic chemists who understand this, they go, uh-uh. Nope. These people are just so far off on how they believe this stuff came together. I have sat with National Academy members and Nobel Prize winners. Sometimes I will say, do you understand this? And if they're afraid to say yes, they say nothing. They just stare at me because they can't sincerely do it. I was once brought in by the, the dean of the department once and many years ago, and he was a chemist, and he was kind of concerned about some things. I said, let me, let me ask you something. You're a chemist. Do you understand this? How do you get, how do you get DNA without a cell membrane? And how do you get a cell membrane without a DNA? And, and how does all this come together from this? He said, Jim, we have no idea. We have no idea. I said, isn't it interesting that you, the dean of science, and I, the chemistry professor, can talk about this quietly in your office, but we can't go out there and talk about this? If you understand evolution, I am fine with that. I'm not going to try to change you, not at all. In fact, I wish I had the understanding that you have. But about seven or eight years ago, I posted on my website that I don't understand. And I said, I will buy lunch for anyone that will sit with me and explain to me evolution. And I won't argue with you until I don't understand something. I will ask you to clarify. But you can't wave by and say, this enzyme does that. You got to get down in the details of where molecules are built for me. Nobody has come forth. The Atheist Society contacted me. The Atheist Atheist Society contacted me. They said that they will buy the lunch. And they challenged the Atheist Society, go down to Houston, have lunch with this guy, and talk to him. Nobody's come. <laughs> now remember, because I'm just going to ask, when I stop understanding what you're talking about, I will ask. So I'm, I sincerely want to know. I would like to believe it. But I just can't. Now, I understand microevolution. I really do. We do this all the time in the lab. I understand this, but when you have speciation changes, when you have organs changing, when you have to have concerted lines of evolution all happening in the same place in time, not just one line, concerted lines all in the same place, all in the same environment, this is very hard to fathom. I was in Israel not too long ago talking with a, a bioengineer, talking with a bioengineer and, and describing to me the, the ear, and he was studying the different changes in the modulus of the ear. And I said, how does this come about? He says, oh, Jim, you know, we all believe in evolution, but we have no idea how it happened. <laughs> you know, there's a good Jewish professor for you. I mean, that's, that's what it is. So that's where I am. Have I answered the question? In your nano what do you consider to be the best evidence for evolution? 
what Darwin considered to be the best evidence for what he called descent with modification in 1859 is still probably the most important evidence today. It's the pattern of classification, the similarities and dissimilarities among all living things. They virtually all have the same genetic code, but then they, they split into categories. You have human beings within the class, within the group of primates, within the mammal uh, class, uh, within uh, the vertebrate uh, subphylum, within the uh, animal kingdom, within the eukaryote, uh, the super kingdom, you might say, that um, this suggests, to a certain kind of imagination at any rate, the notion that there were common ancestors that define each group. All mammals had a common ancestor with the characteristic that defines the class of mammals and that they have inherited that characteristic. Uh, so if you think then that they had a more distant common ancestor that, uh, from which all vertebrates uh, inherited the backbone, then uh, this logically explains why these features exist, so that it makes uh, evolution or descent with modification a very attractive hypothesis, so attractive that Darwin said that it would uh, convince him that his theory was true even if all the other evidence were against him. Now there's a flaw in this whole system, at least uh, more than one flaw in fact. Uh, one is that uh, the hypothesis was taken to be true simply because of its logical and imaginative appeal without checking it out against the, the evidence, like the fossil evidence. It was a, a, uh, a hypothesis that was imposed upon the evidence rather than that was tested by the evidence. Now the other thing that's uh, very interesting about this uh, view of things is that the, the features that create the classification, such as hair or fur in mammals, are called homologies. They're supposed to be inherited from a common ancestor. But in fact, in a great many cases, the homologies are traceable to different parts in the embryo and to different genes. Uh, so, in short, the um, animals get them by an entirely different route, and this is strongly inconsistent with the common ancestry hypothesis uh, to explain them. It's also a well-known fact among uh, embryologists, but it never comes out uh, to the general public because, well, it's so unpalatable a fact and so difficult to explain on Darwinian theory. Without which human or any life could not exist. Dr. A. Cressy Morrison, past president of the New York Academy of Sciences, said, so many essential conditions are necessary for life to exist on our Earth that it is mathematically impossible that all of them could exist in proper relationship by chance. Sir Fred Hoyle, professor of astronomy and mathematics, Oxford University, said, to suppose that the first cell originated by chance it's like believing that a tornado could sweep through a junkyard filled with airplane parts and form a Boeing 747. What do these quotes mean? They mean the science of probability proves evolution to be an impossibility. The more statistically improbable a thing is, the less we can believe it happened by blind chance. Chance, therefore, has no chance of playing any part in creation. The design of life may also be described in terms of information. The scientific name is called specified complexity. Specified complexity can be described as the information content of any arrangement and its size in bits of the shortest algorithm, computer program or code, required to generate that arrangement. The data at the core of life is found in the DNA molecules of each living thing. Since its discovery in 1953, human DNA has been decoded, which has incredibly revealed that DNA molecules actually store, carry, and possess information 
some three billion genetic letters in the form of a four character digital code. DNA has the same relevant properties as an astoundingly complex language. A genetic language such as our human bodies retained must be designed and created. It is not rational to consider any other explanation. Yet, somehow, according to evolutionists, contrary to all evidence and reason, the amazingly complex genetic information found in each cell of our and every living thing's makeup is not designed and created. I would only ask, could the Microsoft software program we use for this program be produced by evolution? I doubt if Billy Gates would accept that idea since his company designed and produced the software. He probably wants to get paid for this product since even evolutionists might admit that the Microsoft Word program just didn't appear out of thin air or arise from the elements that made up a CD-ROM and over time randomly formed Microsoft Word. To believe that a CD-ROM could evolve over billions of years from various elements in the Earth is crazy because it is impossible. But to believe that the computer program in the CD-ROM could evolve is insane. Werner Gitt a professor of information systems, put it directly, quote, it has never been shown that a coding system and semantic information could originate by itself through matter. The information theorems predict that this will never be possible. A purely material origin of life is thus ruled out, unquote. When one considers life, one must realize that life consists of infinite complexity, and because of this fact, life must have been created by an in If Darwinian theory is such a poor theory, why don't more scientists reject it? There are two reasons why more scientists don't reject it. One is that if they did, they would lose um, all of their prestige within science, they would never get another research grant, um, and if they didn't have academic tenure, they'd get fired. Uh, there is a system of thought control over this, uh, which is extremely rigid. It's worth your professional life. That's another reason why an outsider has to be the one to challenge this. So that's reason number one. There's an enforcement mechanism. And even senior people are frightened about it, and they'll tell you if you, you know, get them aside where they don't think they're being overheard. The, um, the second reason uh, is ideological. The great problem is that if Darwinism isn't true, science doesn't know what is true. You see, if the, the microevolution explanation isn't extrapolated to explain all of creation, then they don't know how it could have happened, and that's intolerable. All of the philosophers of science that are writing for the modern era have explained that um, science doesn't like to have no answer. You see, they, they will prefer to stick with a, an inadequate paradigm or general theory um, rather than to say, well, we just don't know what it is because then they, they don't have any place to start uh, uh, proposing experiments, drafting grant, uh, proposals for research grants, and so on. Uh, so, so they'll stick with the false theory if the only alternative is no theory at all, and that's the situation that they're in.